a springtime ring To have a friend right in your corner Your heart will feel a little warmer Tender, loving care Tender, loving care Each warm and friendly touch Let someone know you care Go to our chapter here that is on West Virginia. Okay? And my story is called Three Degrees of Separation. And the title came, if you all know about that movie or even that, that whole idea that we're all six degrees of separation from each other on this planet. That if you start talking and you can work it out within six people that you have a connection and that you have a commonality. But in West Virginia, it's three degrees of separation <laughs> and two if you're Methodist, right? <laughs> okay, right. Recently, a co-worker down here where I work in Virginia came into my office and asked, how is it that if there is a room full of 50 strangers, the two West Virginians always find each other? I laughed and acknowledged this happened repeatedly in my life across the many states where I have lived and traveled. I'll tell you what else is true, I said to this young woman. You know how folks talk about six degrees of separation, meaning when talking to anyone in the world within just six people, we will discover a common person known to both of us? Well, in West Virginia, it seems to only be three degrees of separation and two if we're Methodists. Although spoken in jest, there does seem to be some common denominator in folks who hail from the mountain state. Formed out of Virginia in 1863 in the midst of the Civil War, West Virginia had a rough and stormy birth. West by God, Virginia became a rallying cry, a source of pride for a mountain people who had been a bit of an afterthought to the government in far off Richmond. We were now independent, in charge of ourselves, and alas, poor. Surely to a fault, West Virginians were a trusting people, believing that others were as honorable as themselves. Money for what's under my land? Well, sure, I'll take much needed cash. Why wouldn't I? Won't hurt a thing. You want to cut my trees up and down the hills and down to the river? Heck, they'll grow back. And so it began. Outsiders were making vast sums of money from coal, timber, and oil, while the workers and, all, and landowners often barely eked out a living. A state stripped almost 100% of virgin forest led to massive flooding. Pockets of communities thrived while others floundered. But through it all was a pervading and immense sense of pride. West Virginia is called the Mountain State because of the rugged chain of the Appalachians that cover nearly every part of our state. Deep valleys, hidden hollers, twisting rivers, mountain tops, huge rock formations, formidable winters, country roads. All of this created many isolated communities. There were, though, several things that started to bind the citizens together. Unions, church affiliations, the government in Charleston, an early and exceptional state park system, a statewide 4-H program and state camp, two strong universities and a number of state colleges, 
the Golden Horseshoe Contest taken by students after a mandatory year of West Virginia history. The teaching of school kids to learn all 55 counties in their county seats, the railroads that cross the entire state, and regrettably, a prejudice by outsiders to decry the West Virginian as a lazy, ignorant, dirt poor hillbilly. That stereotype seemed the blanket labeling of all West Virginians, no matter who, what, or where. Outside of the state, West Virginians learned to honk and wave at cars with West Virginia license plates, formed West Virginia clubs in far off places, subscribed to proud periodicals such as the West Virginia Hillbilly newspaper or Golden Seal or wonderful West Virginia magazines. A natural friendliness and where might you be from is one of the first questions a West Virginian will ask of a stranger. Our unique accents and Appalachian cadence of speech is often easily recognizable to each other. We grew up singing the West Virginia Hills, could identify our state bird, knew the state motto, mountaineers are always free, and in later generations, tear up when the song Country Roads came over the radio. What did West Virginia do in forming me a daughter of the mountains? It made me sometimes more trusting than wise. It turned me into a romantic whose knees grow weak at the cry of a distant tra train whistle. As I roam the world and stretch my wings in spirit, a small part of my heart and soul always yearns for a rest along a gurgling stream, the taste of sassafras, the smell of clean mountain air, the glory of rhododendrons in bloom, and the figurative bear hugs of our mountain ridges. I do wonder if all West Virginians have that yearning in their eyes, and that, indeed, is how we so quickly discover each other in that crowded room. Yeah. We've already mentioned 4-H a lot, so I thought I would read my story on 4-H camp. Um, we had a section. OK. <clears throat> We all caught colds from someone's little girl, I think. <laughs> I'm. We love the little girl. Yeah. Hey, welcome to Jane and Hey, hi. 4-H camp. I'm glad I went to 4-H camp each summer, since 4-H club and its projects were a large part of my childhood life. However, at the time, and even looking back, there were pros and cons about going to and being at 4-H camp. The drive to Selbyville in the southern end of our Upshur County was long and curvy. I had to pack whatever I thought I would need for all five days, leaving behind my, at home my mom, my cats, and my privacy. Camp life was run on a schedule for all 24 hours each day. A bell to get up, a bell to line up for meals, classes in the morning and sports in the afternoon, supper in the evening, and the big campfire each evening. At camp, we were always part of a tribe. There were four tribes, and I was a Mingo. My older sister, Anne, had been a Mingo, too. I probably didn't pick Kay's Cherokees or Greenbrier's Delaware, since in, tribe <coughs> Since in tribe cheers, we had to spell out the name of our tribe, and I never could spell. <laughs> After the evening campfire, we had a little time to get to our cabins and wash up, and then it was lights out and quiet at the sound of another bell. Each tribe was rewarded or penalized for each member's performance or obedience. Was our lunch line straight? Mingos would get four points. Was my bed um, maintained perfectly? A point for our tribe. Did we win the volleyball game? More points. Did the counselors like our cheer or skit or story around the campfire? We got points. At the end of the week, 
one tribe, one first place. Perhaps it was a good lesson to learn to come in third place. <laughs> I did not like the wet dew in early mornings. I did like the sunset and the echo over the hills. The river, the wide valley, the grassy yard, and the athletic playing fields were serene settings. The food was always good, even if the cement dining hall was noisy. Several of my town friends came with me to 4-H camp. By the time I reached junior high and high school, I knew most of the other 4-Hers, no matter where they were from. Our West Virginia in the 1950s and 60s didn't have much diversity, except an imaginary one between city and country. We also had a few children with disabilities. One gal, Nancy, with muscular dystrophy, who used a crutch to walk, was a 4-H'er. She was also a Mingo. Children often struggle with someone who is different. I am thankful today I knew Nancy during those summer camp days, since we have renewed our friendship in the last dozen years. Nancy, who is near my age, presently lives in a nursing home. She is a brave woman, whom I enjoy visiting whenever I return to my hometown. 4-H camp offered me that opportunity. Another positive outcome from those camp years is being able to look back at my parents' commitment to 4-H and Selbyville. Dad was the camp doctor. He checked all the children for general health on the first day of camp. He returned to camp for any health needs. He also loved to visit camp for a meal. Mom often joined him during the week, usually on Thursday evening. Mom wrote her children a postcard or two during our five days at camp. Those five days seemed so long. My parents worked for years to have a swimming pool built at the camp since the river swimming hole seemed a bit dangerous to dad. The experience of trying to raise the money to build the pool made my parents compassionate and understanding toward me years later when I had to begin to raise all my funds to be a full-time missionary. They knew that expectations from some folks could be brought low, and yet the most unlikely person would make a sacrificial gift. The pool finally got built at the camp. It is probably one of the reasons that camp has continued to be used by hundreds of youth who not only attend 4-H camp there, but also church youth camp and band camp. They, too, can wake up in the mornings and hear the whippoorwills. As you know, in the Almond family, we always owned a dog. And his name was always Briar. Same, same name. So I thought I would read a story about my Briar. <clears throat> here, Briar, here, Briar. This call, along with a loud whistle, was a familiar sound in the Almond household. We always had a collie dog named Briar. Or should I say, Dad, oh, Dad always had a dog that he had graciously assigned to one of us. <laughs> Greenbriar's Briar, Kay's Briar, Ann's Briar, Ruth's dog was named Licker because we had two dogs at once, and Beth's Mick Briar. <clears throat> I remember my Briar the best because he was the dog we had during those growing up years from preschool through <coughs> seventh grade. He was our constant and closest, closest companion. Each of us loved him as our friend. And before the days of leash laws and fences, we took Briar everywhere we went. He barked with glee as we made angels in the new fallen snow. He helped us run through the sprinkler on hot summer days. He cuddled up with us by the fireplace and slept at the foot of our beds. Mom encouraged him to go with us on hikes through the fields because she said he chased the snakes away. She was not happy, though, when this same sweet dog ruined her flowers by plopping down on her gladiolias and geraniums. <clears throat> Nonetheless, Briar and Mom shared a special relationship, keeping each other company when his playmates and her kids were at school each day. Briar watched over us and provided company and comfort. 
One afternoon when I was only four, I was running my fastest to keep up with the older kids in the neighborhood gang as they raced down the road in front of the Daniels' house. Scurrying on my short, chubby legs, I tripped on the coal-based road and skinned my knee pretty badly. The other kids, not hearing my yells, ran on ahead, but Bri Briar returned to me immediately. He stood perfectly still beside me, letting me grab his long hair to pull myself up. With sniffles and a bloody knee, I hobbled home, holding tight to my dog's collar. When I was more grown up, around the age of 10, and needed to escape the chaos of our noisy house, Briar and I would often walk to the pine thickets of the city park to our secret thinking spot. Briar would plop down and I'd spread out on the cool ground beside him, resting my head on his soft belly. Nothing was more comforting than lying there with him, looking at the blue sky peeping through the trees. While Briar made each of us feel like his favorite, he liked everyone. He loved greeting house guests and hanging out on second base when we played neighborhood softball and gently putting his nose on Mrs. Stansberry's lap and nudging Grandma Flanagan. He nipped at our horse, Pinto Scout, and teased the cat, Dick Roston, and chased our <laughs> rabbits, Pete and Repeat. <clears throat> Briar's appearance in several Christmas pictures is a testimony to his status as a valued member of our family. Briar posing on the living room couch, Briar by the fence, Briar in front of the swing under the maple tree. He was happiest playing with his kids, barking at our heels when we ran through the fields or sledded down the snowy hills. The summer I was 12, Briar lost his long battle with epilepsy. Mom walked out to the horse pasture where I was camping with friends. She stuck her head into our tent and told me that my Briar was dying. As I stepped back on the back porch, he tried to lift his head and managed a small thump of his tail. I sprawled out next to him and one last time, gave him a big hug and bid farewell to my good friend. My home in the hills, the West Virginia piece. Mom was a naturalist who knew and loved the wildflowers, the birds, the trees of West Virginia. Dad was a naturalized citizen who gave his heart to West Virginia when he first came to West, Wesleyan College from Milburn, New Jersey, right near Newark and New York City. Mom and Dad gave their love of West Virginia as a gift to us. Dad invited each of us to go on calls with him. We saw every kind of house and shack and lean-to in Upshur County, and we felt Dad's deep respect for his patients. Annie and I worked in Dad's office and learned more of, the, um, of these folks that Dad served, some interesting characters. Every time we crossed the state line after visits to cousins in Pittsburgh or New Jersey, we would break out into, oh, the hills, beautiful hills, how I love the West Virginia hills. Later, when Ruth and Rich and their two sons were coming home, uh, they sang out the West Virginia Hills, and six-year-old Christopher, who's now 28, oh my God, 28, <laughs> woo, declared, now I feel real. <laughs> Wendell Berry, one of my favorite Appalachian writers, says that many people are displaced, but he has a different situation. He is placed. Yes, I was placed from the very beginning, and that has given me great freedom. I have loved living in Cleveland, in Boston, in New York City. I have loved traveling all over Europe, India, Brazil, and Russia. That freedom to go and explore comes from knowing my place, my home among the hills. Mom was our 4-H leader. 4-H built pride with songs and stories and camp projects. My favorite 4-H project was West Virginia trees. How I love the sycamore and spruce and oak and redbud. 
public school gave an em emphasis to West Virginia, two full years of West Virginia history, the Golden Horseshoe Award, and for me in sixth grade, the singing of the West Virginia Hills every morning, just before the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The hills formed all of us here in this place, row after scattered row of lumps of earth blanketed with such life. Hard to travel up and down and through the rhododendron thickets, hard to get from one <coughs> hollow to the next, hard to be neighborly when the roads were impossible and the rivers were wild and fickle. This just suited the Scotch-Irish who settled here, isolated, independent, making do, creative, and honest and hardworking with wry humor, also shy and backward and gullible when the lumber barons and coal barons, the lumber barons and coal barons and gas barons came along with special deals. While settling on some of the richest real estate in the world, West Virginians became poor. West Virginians have been had so often we seem defeated, oppressed. West Virginia is now 49th or 50th in ways that matter. Number of dropouts, number of teen pregnancies, number of meth labs, number of guns per person, number of kids who fight and die in all our wars. Because I started with such love of my place and because I was eager to learn the real stories, thank you Marvin Carr and Mary Lee Dougherty, I learned about how colonies work and about the exploitation of resources and about the use and abuse of stereotypes. I refused to be put down. I felt righteously defensive and feisty and more and more in love with this place that has formed me, my home. You sense a theme here, I'm sure. <laughs> Stories of a West Virginia family. Uh, and uh, mountaineers are always free. Another piece of, the, uh, of, our, of who we are. Our West Virginia state motto says it all. Mountaineers are always free. Celebrating West Virginia Day each June 20 with our centennial year in 1963 when I became 15 years old gave plenty of chances for Montanae Semper Liberi to sink in. <clears throat> Helping Dad display the United States flag for multiple occasions, including West Virginia Day, lent weight to the concept of being free. I realized that I am part of something bigger than myself. Joy and contentment came from pledging allegiance to old glory. The joy was complete when I declared mountaineers are always free. My concept of being free evolved. At first, I focused on the idea of free as in no cost or bargain. <laughs> Dad took us grocery shopping at the a and grocery store on Spring Street in downtown Buchanan, across from the Coca-Cola bottling plant. We had mom's list of food and supplies to purchase, and Dad would have us look for spatial deals, such as Ann Page store labels. Mm -hmm. What fun to imagine that Dr. Basil Page, who uh, earlier there was a, a family in and, and Dr. Basil Page delivered two babies uh, to that family. Um, uh, but to imagine that Dr. Basil Page's daughter, Ann Page, uh, had a bargain for us. That was, the dad would often assist Dr. Page in surgical cases from gallbladders to hernias. Dad loved his coffee. I remember grinding the coffee beans right on the spot. The aroma of fresh coffee would waft through the air as I held the red bag under the grinder. Another way I began to appreciate being free came from the custom in our home of constantly reading. We would sit together, hmm, like this. <laughs> yes, uh, 65 years, 67 years of this. Uh, <laughs> we would sit together in the sunny uh, summer kitchen 
or around the kitchen, ta- kitchen fireplace in the winter, relishing our time of reading. Dad especially liked the West Virginia hillbilly. He would read out loud from the back page column entitled The Comstock Load. Editor Jim Comstock certainly served up rare gold nuggets of folklore. He built it as a weekly newspaper, (laughs) W-E-A-K-L-Y. But I saw that being a mountaineer or a hillbilly means a lot of things, but never being weak. The good-natured joking often explored, explored explored our stubborn streak with a passion for independence. Our role models wearing buckskin grew to fit me. I realized Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier, from the first grade Walt Disney movie, released a, a song about him. How special to sing about being born on a mountaintop in the home of the free. Receiving a birthday gift of a coonskin cap, which, by the way, when Maria went off to college at Wellesley, I got her actually a skunk hat, <laughs> roadkill skunk hat, but, but I was thinking coonskin. <laughs> I don't know that she used that. She had it. Yes, uh, she's an honest girl. <laughs> uh, but I had a coonskin cap, which I wore proudly on house calls, helping me match Dad, who wore a Russian fur hat in the unheated Willie's Jeep. I felt proud to be a mountaineer. The Latin phrase for always, semper, grew to have spatial meeting the year our family drove to Raynell, West Virginia, to visit the United Methodist Church, built entirely of chestnut lumber. It's where Mom and Dad were married on June 11, 1945. Uh, Grandfather Reverend Paul L. Flanagan conducted the service, and Grandfather Henry David Amon came by railroad from New Jersey to witness the union when they promised to always be true to their, uh, to their vows. <clears throat> Another type of nut tree, the walnut, hey, Greg, uh, and the promise of uh, fidelity uh, became connected for me. One grove near our hilltop home, where we built a winter shed for our horse Pinto Scout, was planted by mom and dad with black walnut trees. They prized those trees for the promise of future harvest. Grandmother Mary Flanagan prized the wood's dirt she had me gather for the flower garden from under the walnut trees. Her wonderful pansies with their smiling face added to my joy. Each fall, the trees faithfully blessed us with an abundance of walnuts, which blackened our hands as we opened the shells and led us to the reward of 4 H recipes of walnut fudge. Just to think about growing up Someplace else makes me shudder. (laughs) How wonderful to be a West Virginian, where mountaineers are always free. The Almond children have a proud, freedom-loving, promise-keeping heritage honoring our hillbilly home, nestled in the Appalachian Mountains of the United States of America. Stories of a West Virginia Doctor, written by Dr. Harold D. Allman. A collection of 55 short stories about his experience as a small-town doctor in central West Virginia. And tender, loving care. Stories from a West Virginia Doctor, Volume 2, written by Dr. Greenbrier Allman. Using videotapes to write 70 additional stories of his father's very colorful life as a small-town doctor. They can be found for purchase at Amazon.com and most local bookstores. Tune into Channel 3 Buckhannon for Tender Loving Care with Dr. Greenbrier Allman, where he talks about the connection between Christianity and medicine.